Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome. Welcome to the Newbold College Diversity Centre for its second event of the academic year. Uh, welcome to those people who are from uh, our local college community here, but I see many people from beyond there, from, from the uh, local Anglican Church, welcome, and also from uh, uh, other Christians from Wokingham, and also some various stops around the M25. I see some of you have braved the M25 this evening for this event. Uh, bravo, that's all I can say. Welcome. Um, let me just begin by saying that uh, the Newbold College Diversity Centre uh, is now in its 15th year and we like to explore various issues in diversity uh, as a college, uh, as a church uh, and also uh, as part of a wider society which is in a huge state of flux. We think it's extremely important to seek understanding of that of those who are other who are different from uh, from ourselves, um, and this these seminars are devoted to uh, enriching our understandings of people who are, uh, are different from ourselves. Uh, that's not always uh, a popular angle to take um, in times of um, quick uh, and uh, um, impressive migrations of peoples and so it's particularly important at a time like this I think that we do seek genuinely to understand those who are other than we are. Uh, it's the Newbold College Diversity Centre which is hosting uh, the beach lecture. This, this Today is the, uh, the annual beach, beach lecture. Uh, for those of you who are unaware of its provenance, maybe I should just say this, that the, this annual lecture was endowed by Bert and Eliane Beach, who sadly can't be with us tonight. They're, they're well enough, but they find that the journey from uh, uh, Maryland to here is getting increasingly difficult. And so they said with regret they were unable to make that journey uh, this time. Um, Bert Beach used to work at the Adventist Church headquarters in St Albans. Uh, and this lecture is an endowed lecture in the memory of uh, Bert's father, W.R. Beach. Both Bert and his father were uh, committed educators, and Bert particularly a committed uh, ecumenist. And so when he endowed, uh, when he and his wife endowed this lecture, the, um, the brief really was that it should be an exercise in bridge building. And that's what we have tried to be faithful to throughout the history of the lecture. It's the importance of understanding others, of creating um, bridges to others. I always rib Bert that he's a kind of uh, Adventist Pontifex Maximus. Um, he, he rejects the label. <laughs> Um, so, it's, it's, this is more than about trying to respect uh, other um, groupings that are different from our own, but in some way drawing on those resources which may exist in those communities, uh, which I think we shall be able to do tonight. We seek to avoid stereotyping uh, and misunderstandings, uh, which ultimately, of course, lead to violence. Uh, and so this is a small attempt on our part to maximise understanding and to reduce violence, even if that violence is only verbal. So welcome uh, to the uh, 2015 Beach Lecture and a particular welcome uh, to our speaker, um, the Reverend Dr. Sam Wells. Um, on my left here. He is a vicar of St. Martin's in the Fields, was uh, called to that appointment in, in the summer of 2012. How would you like your address to be uh, Trafalgar Square? Sam Wells, Trafalgar Square, that would reach you, I imagine, would it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so he's, the, he's leading the ministry uh, in St. Martin's in the Field. He, uh, has been priest in his earlier years in Newcastle and Cambridge and Norwich. Uh, his education was completed at Oxford 
uh, Edinburgh and Durham. That's where he's, he did a PhD in um, Christian ethics uh, in Durham. Um, and the, the, the title of his thesis I found quite intriguing, How the Church Performs Jesus' Story. How the Church Performs Jesus' Story. I think that's something which has informed his work uh, ever since. Uh, he's the author of uh, some 20 books. The latest one, published a couple of months ago in May, uh, is called A Nazareth Manifesto. Uh, that's got an intriguing title, I think. Um, and it plays on the idea that we are not uh, called to work for people. We are called to work with people. And uh, uh, I know Sam believes that uh, with is one of the most important words for Christians to use in, in their vocabulary. He's also a visiting professor of Christian ethics at King's College London. Um, it seems that he has always felt that um, understanding and being with the poor uh, is a significant part of his uh, vocation. Of course, Martin, St. Martin's in the Field becomes an important part of, of that story. Uh, he's worked in quite a few urban priority areas during his ministry. Um, and uh, St. Martin's in the Field, as you are probably aware, aware has got uh, more than a century's experience of working with the homeless. Uh, his job before coming to St. Martin's in the field was as Dean of Chapel at Duke University. Um, and I would say to you that if you ever feel in need of a good sermon, then you should go onto YouTube and go onto Duke University Chapel, and then there's uh, a great deal of, uh, a great many of Sam's sermons on there. Well worth a visit. I've listened to many. Uh, and he was also a, a research professor at the Duke Divinity School while he was there. Um, back to the, 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 his latest book, a, a Nazareth Manifesto, uh, he says of it that um, we should remember that Jesus spent a week in Jerusalem working for us, three years in Galilee working with us, and 30 years in Nazareth being with us, uh, and that those statistics uh, demand our, our due attention. He says also um, that writing and studying for him is a form of prayer. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, writing and studying a form of prayer. People, he says, often ask him how he finds the time uh, to, to write these books, 20 or so books. And the answer he gives apparently is always the same. Writing is part of what it means for me to flourish and to breathe. And so this evening, uh, I hope that we will learn to breathe and that we will flourish as we listen to our 2015 Beach Lecturer, Reverend Dr. Sam Wells. Will you please show him that you're glad that he's here? Um, well, thank you for that warm welcome, that lovely introduction. That was, that was beautiful. Thank you. I feel... Oh, ooh. there we go. Uh, I'm very glad to be here, and I feel very warmly welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, the subject of my lecture is the stone that the builders rejected. As a child, I used to love going to the beach. Growing up in the West Country, we had the unparalleled splendors of Western Supermare, just an hour away. What could be better than that? But if there wasn't a sandy beach available, I wasn't disheartened, because that meant I could spend a half hour sorting through pebbles to find which ones looked like they would skim well. I'd pick up a handful of stones and sift through them, tossing most of them aside, until I found one that was worthy of being hurled flat side down into the incoming tide. 
It's something we do all the time. At the supermarket, we survey the apples or peaches or bananas and choose the ones with no bruises. On TV, we enjoy shows where a person with talent is selected while their rivals slink into the corner, their hopes shattered. Any craftsperson will examine numerous paintbrushes or pieces of wood or images before settling on the one to work on and setting aside the rest. I imagine everyone here has stood in a playground at primary school while two captains picked teams for a game of football or rounders or netball or touch rugby. There's a fight over who's going to be captains and then there's celebrations and disappointments as good players are separated into teams. And then invariably comes the moment as the better players become impatient to start while the stragglers are still waiting to be picked when one of the captains says the immortal words, I'll have her and you can have the rest. While the rest are indicated with a dismissive sweep of the hand. You can have the rest. I wonder if you're one of the rest, then or now. I wonder if you know what it means for your talents to be regarded as negligible and no one much to care whose side you're on. That dismissive sweep of the hand can be the defining point of a person's life. What's it like to be those ones that are rejected? What's it like to be that apple that's tossed away, that piece of wood that's useless, the rounders player that no one wants, that, that stone that the builders decide to set aside? I'm currently part of a congregation where perhaps a majority of people know exactly what it feels like. Why? Because St. Martin in the Fields has a reputation for having an ever open door to those who've been rejected. And a community that's well known for putting the rejected at its heart is likely to assemble around it a bunch of people who identify with those feelings of rejection, even if their life circumstances superficially seem that little bit more secure. My suspicion is pretty much everyone at St. Martin's feels in some significant way like an outsider, either because they know exactly what it feels like to be told they're not wanted somewhere, or because they're carrying a secret that if revealed, could they fear produce the same effect. Stay with that feeling of rejection for a moment if it's not too painful. Rejection keys into our profound feelings of unworthiness, of being useless, peripheral, no more than a passenger in a world of drivers. It makes us feel stupid, ugly, and unlovable. It digs into a place that suggests this would all be much better without me. Either you fight the rejection and risk being seen as a person who just doesn't get it, or you accept the rejection and assume the identity of someone whom the world would be better off without. I worked in a community for several years where one of the leaders once said to me, you know, we're a bunch of misfits who somehow fit together. What he was recognizing was that rather than rebelling against feelings of rejection, we'd found if we worked constructively with them, we could become something rather beautiful. And that's something we've discovered at St. Martin in the Fields. We sometimes use the word inclusion, but inclusion isn't really the right word. It isn't the right word because it suggests there are a bunch of people in the center whose lives are normal and sorted and privileged, and they should jolly well open the doors and welcome people in and be a bit more thoughtful and kind and generous. The problem with this is that it's such a patronizing and paternalistic model. When the community leader said, we're a bunch of misfits who somehow fit together, he wasn't regarding himself as normal and secure and somehow above it all. He was one of the misfits too. He was reframing the whole idea that there was a center and a periphery, where the center gave kindly hospitality to the periphery, because the cost of that idea is that the periphery feels humiliated and the center feels smug. 
What we've discovered at St. Martin's is that if you're looking for a cornerstone, the best place to look is among the stones that the builders have rejected. Not long ago, we hosted an evening on dementia and faith. And what electrified the evening was when a person with dementia and a person caring for a loved one with dementia each spoke with wisdom, courage, and truth. Those with dementia must be among the most rejected in our society. But that night, it was brilliantly obvious that the Holy Spirit was speaking through them. For some time now, St. Martin's has hosted events surrounding disability and faith. One event began with a person with autism describing in unforgettable detail what it would have, been, what it would have felt like for a person like him to be present in the crowd at the first Palm Sunday and how the sensory overload would have done his head in. No one listening could ever see all the hosannas and palm branches in such an innocent way again. Some while ago, St. Marcin's hosted an event for single people in which participants explored the advantages and disappointments, sadness and opportunity of being voluntarily or involuntarily single. Again, it was a discovery of solidarity, wisdom and hope. On another occasion, St. Martin's hosted an event for those fleeing oppressive societies on account of their sexual identity. These were stones the builders had rejected, if you ever saw them. But coming together in the company of others who'd been rejected in different ways, they could find inspiration and purpose beyond fear and escape. One of the perhaps unique features of St. Martin's is that it's both a parish church and a cathedral-like focal point, both a gathering point for waifs and strays and a royal foundation at a global crossroads. One of the particular ministries we've developed is in what you might call acute pastoral services. We have gatherings for those affected by suicide, to support families of the missing, to remember victims of homicide, to commemorate those who've died homeless. The one thing that these occasions have in common is that they all proclaim that wisdom and faith are found in the places of exile and rejection. They're a reminder of how the Bible came to be written. Israel was in Babylon, in exile, captured and deported by the Chaldeans, dragged a thousand miles due east. It was angry, guilty, depressed, despairing, doubtful, paralyzed, powerless. And what Israel did was to piece together the half-remembered stories of its people from a thousand years before, stories of slavery, escape, and freedom. Most crucial of all were the stories at the heart of the narrative, stories of the time in the wilderness, when slavery was a memory, but true freedom was still out of reach. These stories were crucial because that's how Israel was feeling in a new wilderness called Babylon, in a desolate season called exile. We recognize the feeling, it's what it means to feel you're the stone the builders rejected. The exiles in Babylon wrote down their people's wilderness history because it had important lessons for their own present and future. And what they came to realize was that they were closer to God in exile than they'd ever been in the promised land. That's the discovery on which the whole Bible rests. Let me read you some words from Acts chapter 4. The rulers, elders, and scribes assembled in Jerusalem with Annas the high priest, Caiaphas, John, and Alexander, and all who were of the high priestly family. When they'd made Peter and John stand in their midst, they inquired, by what power or by what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, rulers of the people and elders, if we are questioned today because of a good deed done to someone who was sick, and we are asked how this man has been healed, let it be known to all of you and to all the people of Israel that this man is standing before you in good health by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, whom God raised from the dead. This Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders. It has become the cornerstone. When Peter stood before the Sanhedrin, called to account for how he had enabled a crippled beggar to walk, he looked back into Israel's story, in which God had founded the kingdom not on any of Jesse's tall and powerful sons, but on David, the youngest and the weakest. 
Peter quotes Psalm 118, which describes the choosing of David with the words, the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, it has become the cornerstone. And Peter identifies that rejected stone as Jesus. In his crucifixion, Jesus was rejected by the builders. Yet in his resurrection, he became the cornerstone of forgiveness and eternal life. Think for a moment about my denomination, about the Church of England, and the way the Church of England sees itself. It's built churches all around the country that mostly look like centers of power and authority. It's extended hospitality and a sometimes clumsy but mostly generous-hearted desire to welcome the misfit and the stranger. But it feels it's losing its grip on the country. I wonder whether that's because the critical mass of the sorted and normal no longer assumes church of, is part of what it means to be sorted and normal. Or whether the whole idea of a sorted and normal center was profoundly flawed all along. It could well be that fewer people attend church services, but a whole lot more people are belonging to support groups for parents of Down syndrome children or relatives of those killed in road traffic accidents. And when you attend such gatherings, they sometimes feel a good deal more engaged, alive and focused than a lot of church services. What I saw at the evening on dementia and faith was something that felt like the renewal of the church. It felt like the church was finding a new cornerstone, a cornerstone made up of stones that the builders had rejected. The recently released film Pride tells the true story of a group of lesbian and gay activists in London in 1984. They realize that the way society, media, and government despise them is equivalent to the way the same forces think about the miners who are in the midst of their titanic struggle with the Thatcher government. The lesbian and gay activists get it into their heads to reach out to a depressed mining village in South Wales. The film shows how with patience and forgiveness, grace and solidarity, and a lot of courage and resilience, prejudices on both sides are gradually broken down and an amazing alliance grows up. The film ends with coachloads of miners coming unanticipated to join the 1985 Gay Pride March in London. It's an astonishing turnaround. Together, these two groups of stones that the builders have rejected set aside bitterness and self-pity and find they've become one another's cornerstone. A bunch of misfits somehow beautifully, movingly, somehow fit together. It's an icon of what the church can be, what the church perhaps should be. The church is down in the dumps because it thinks it needs to be full of big and strong and powerful people. But Jesus was the stone the builders rejected, and in his ministry he surrounded himself with stones that the builders had rejected. Jesus didn't found the church on the so-called center, the sorted, the normal, the benevolent, and the condescending. Jesus assumed the church would always need the work of the Holy Spirit, the work of miracle subversion, of turning the world upside down. Nothing has changed except for a lot of the intervening years, the church has forgotten who Jesus was and whose company he kept. We're not talking about a bland and affirming insight that a lot of people who've been overlooked in life turn out to have some important things to contribute. That's true, but what Peter sees in Acts chapter 4 is much more radical than that. The stone that the builders rejected didn't find a place in the wall somewhere by being thoughtfully included like a last-minute addition to a family photo. The rejected stone became the cornerstone, the keystone, the stone that held up all the others, the crucial link, the vital connection. That's what ministry is all about, not condescendingly making welcome alienated strangers, but seeking out the rejected precisely because they are the energy and the life force that will transform us all. Every pastor, every missionary, every evangelist, every disciple should have these words over their desk, their windscreen, on their screensaver, in the photo section of their wallet, wherever they see it all the time, the stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. If you're looking for where the future church is coming from, look at what the church and society has so blithely rejected. 
the life of the church is about constantly recognizing the sin of how much we've rejected and celebrating the grace that God gives us back what we once rejected to become the cornerstone of our lives. Harry's story was related to me by a friend called Robin. While studying for the Lutheran ministry, Robin was placed in a parish in Akron, Ohio. Harry was a member of Robin's placement parish. Members of the pastoral staff of the parish went to see him at home once a week. They generally brought a tape of the Sunday service, a pew slip, and the sacrament. It tended to be the last roll handed out at the staff meeting. The time came for Robin to take her turn on the visiting rotor and discover why. When Robin first called on Harry, she got a shock. Harry lived in a rundown white clapboard house. He was a big person sitting in an overstuffed armchair with an oxygen tank beside it. His legs were virtually useless. The house was pervaded by a smell of must, urine, and dirt. It was repulsive. Nonetheless, Robin went a second time, and gradually Harry came to trust that she would return regularly. As he realized he was not going to be rejected by her, he began to talk more about himself and the way he saw things. Yet he seldom said much about his debilitating physical condition or the squalor in which he was living. One day, Harry said to Robin, it's time for you to have a look in the cellar. Reluctantly and somewhat uneasily, Robin walked to the cellar door. She carefully opened it and looked into the darkness. Go down the steps, Harry insisted, realizing her hesitancy. To Robin's astonishment, she saw a large and imposing weaver's loom set up in the basement. There were piles of old clothes and torn strips of cloth. Robin stared in amazement. After trying for some time without success to relate the creativity of what she saw to the dirt and smell of the man she knew, she came back up the stairs totally bemused. Harry instructed Robin to bring him a pile of rugs from the kitchen. He took them from her and put them down in front of him and began to tell the story of his life. He explained that he took in any old clothes that nobody wanted and scraps of cloth from the rubbish heap. He then wove them into something new. The something new was the pile of rag rugs she'd found stacked in his kitchen. He then gave what he'd made to people who needed a rug. Why did he do it? Because, he said, he felt he was like the old clothes and the waste cloth. He was on the rubbish heap of life, alienated from his friends and his family, unable to work, unable even to breathe properly. He gave Robin his finest rug. Some weeks later, she conducted his funeral. The time came for her to return to her seminary and complete her studies. At one tutorial, she shared Harry's story with a group of her colleagues. After the session, a fellow student touched Robin's arm, took her to one side, and said, Harry was my uncle. The student was in tears, for she realized that she'd lost her chance of reconciliation with him. She'd thought of Harry as a pariah, but she could now see he was a saint. Robin retrieved her precious rug, which Harry had given her, and gave it to her fellow student. Even after his death, Harry's ministry was transforming the lives of people whom he touched. As Robin told me the story, she added finally, I'm still moved by his witness. The stone that the builders rejected had become the cornerstone. Similar factors are at work in a number of Old Testament narratives. For example, the tension in the Joseph story begins when he's one of the youngest of Jacob's sons, yet the eldest son of the favored wife and recipient of his father's gift. He is the stone that the builders rejected, first by his brothers who throw him into the pit and then by Potiphar who has him thrown into jail. But in saving Egypt from famine and saving his family from starvation, Joseph becomes the cornerstone. Likewise, Samson is an exalted figure who, when he becomes blind, imprisoned, mocked, and exiled, achieves more than in his days of glory. I'd like to dwell on one particular story for a few moments, the story of Ruth. The story of Ruth tells how the stone that the builders rejected became the cornerstone. The needy migrant turns into the source of national renewal. 
This tiny story, almost entirely made up of dialogue, epitomizes a journey from rejection to belonging that we need to make today. The backdrop is a political environmental crisis in Israel during the time of the judges. The rule of law had been practically abandoned and famine menaced the land. The people of Israel were sworn enemies of the Moabites because the Moabites were seen as the fruit of incest between Lot and his daughters and because they'd refused to help Moses and his people when they themselves were strangers in the wilderness. Around 15 times in four chapters, we're told Ruth is a foreigner or a Moabitess. Ruth is like an archetypal asylum seeker today, a sexually dangerous woman from a suspicious country with a foreign religion bringing a basket load of trouble. It turns out she's the bringer of salvation. Her son Obed is set to become the grandfather of David, Israel's greatest king. The story hinges on two face-to-face -face relationships, the sympathy between the Israelite widow Naomi and her daughter-in-law, the Moabite widow Ruth, and the reciprocity between the same Moabitess Ruth and the wealthy but childless kinsman Boaz. Ruth faces isolation as a foreign widow amidst a famine. She's vulnerable to being molested in the barley field and begins the story facing humiliation and death. But she pledges her loyalty to Naomi now and forever, and she matches her impoverishment with Boaz's resources, his lack of an heir with her youth and attractiveness, his dilatory paralysis with her initiative and energy, her neediness with his ability to navigate the legal niceties in her favor. There's no need to be sentimental about Ruth's story. She faces a terrible crisis as the story begins. It's not necessary to portray her, her simply as a pious, devoted daughter-in-law who discovers an influential kinsman and patron and makes him her husband. She uses guile and seduction to achieve what her lowly social status would never have given her. But we also have to recognize what she gives up in becoming an Israelite, taking on her mother-in-law's family, language, town, and religion, she takes the path of total assimilation. If we think about migrants today, host cultures shouldn't be pious and assume all asylum seekers will be guileless and innocent. But neither may a host culture assert its customs so strongly that it demands every migrant adopts those traditions from the word go. But just as much as we shouldn't overplay Ruth as a model of the perfect asylum seeker, so we mustn't miss the depth of her story. She sticks with Naomi through thick and thin. Boaz shapes his life to redeem her, and in doing so finds a blessing. Together, Ruth and Boaz portray for us the faithfulness of God. This is how God works, with steadfast love at personal cost, facing adversity, never letting us go, sometimes using guile, sometimes shrewdness, always disarming us with goodness and constantly pointing to a purpose beyond what we can yet see. Ruth is Jesus, who goes into the far country and becomes one like us and brings about our salvation. But Boaz is also Jesus, for like Jesus, Boaz takes on his shoulders the troubles of one he doesn't need to help and brings deliverance at great cost to himself. Now we see the political implications of what we're exploring about the stone that the builders rejected. The issue of immigration is conventionally discussed as a question of duty. The issue is whether Britain is obliged to take in people who are fleeing persecution elsewhere, how one can verify that the claim is genuine, whether one has to limit the number even of the persecuted, and whether anyone migrating largely for economic benefit has any right to be here. What Ruth's story shows is that the foreigner who appears to be nothing more than a bundle of trouble turns out to bring vital initiative and energy and ultimately becomes the harbinger of the nation's hope of renewal. And what Ruth evokes in the host country is to stir in Boaz an awareness of his own scarcity and to inspire him to actions that write his place in salvation history. To turn our back on migrants is to forget our identity, inhibit our renewal, and deny our destiny. This isn't saying taking away border controls, uh, take away border controls and dismantle quota policies, but it is saying it's time to change our framework for the whole conversation about migration. 
Migrants are not fundamentally a threat and a danger. They're first and foremost a challenge to the church to re-inhabit its true identity and a gift to the nation to rediscover its lost energy. You can have too much of a good thing, but immigrants are fundamentally a good thing. We're all migrants, or the sons and daughters thereof. Jesus was a migrant too. To forget that is to forget who we are and to forget who God is. And the reason I've got a particular care for this issue is that I am a migrant. I was born in Canada, was brought to this country as a baby, and as an adult left to make a life in America. I migrated back to this country not that long ago. On each occasion, I was welcomed as a stranger and seen as a blessing, a source of hope and renewal. And most importantly, in 1938, my mother came to this country as an asylum seeker. The danger she escaped was real. She left Berlin just in time. She learned a new language and new customs in a foreign land. In time, she found her Boaz. And that's how I come to be here today. I can't avoid the conclusion that if Britain had had the same attitude and policy towards asylum seekers then that it has today, I would never have been born. And by the way, I didn't mention my mother's name. She was called Ruth. And now we can see that turning the rejected stone into the cornerstone is a constant theme in the Gospels. Jesus' calling of the 12 disciples is a rounding up of the 12 stray tribes of Israel. His ministry to the social outcast is an ingathering of the exiled. Thus, Jesus combines the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 2 that the nations will stream back to Zion and all find a place at the Lord's house with the injunction of Leviticus 25, that the oppressed will go free and that if they found redemption as the years go by, they and their children with them shall go free in the jubilee year. The most common picture of heaven is of a great banquet and the most common sphere of conflict in Jesus' ministry is the dinner table. It's in the act of eating that reincorporating the rejected stone is practiced and its significance perceived by friend and foe. The feeding of the 5,000 is a paradigmatic story of reincorporation, wherein the disciples take pains to ensure that no morsel of bread is wasted and they find 12 baskets full. This is a pattern and a promise of reincorporation, a picture of the restoration of Israel through the ministry of Jesus and the mission of his disciples. Once there was a struggling young Christian who felt she couldn't share the truth about who she was and avoided intimacy with anyone she met in the church because she assumed straight away that she would meet with rejection and exclusion. Eventually, she found the courage to open her heart to a gentle companion who simply said, what you have told me is that you're a human being. I see that as cause for compassion, not for condemnation. Those words changed her life. From that moment on, the young Christian found a freedom she'd never known and resolved to spend her life having the liberating effect on others that her companion's wisdom had had on her. She realized that there was something deeper than that others had rejected her. What was really going on was that she'd rejected herself, or at least a part of her that was a source of life and growth and hope. She'd been the builder that had rejected the stone. In devoting her life to liberating others who'd known similar rejection, she turned the stone that she had rejected into the cornerstone. I wonder what part of yourself you've rejected. I wonder whether, like that young woman, that part of you could become the cornerstone of your life, your faith, your ministry to others. I wonder who you've rejected and whether one day you'll come to see that person for who they really are and see the gift they are to you. The following story was told to me by a friend called Malcolm. He was a priest in a parish which developed a particular ministry to the rehabilitation of young offenders. This ministry included the development of a furniture resource center, which used to take in old and damaged furniture, restore it to a usable condition, and make it available to those living on low incomes or being rehoused. In the course of this ministry, Malcolm came across Paul, who was a 15-year-old with a history of misusing drugs. To finance his dependence, Paul had become proficient at breaking and entering homes and pilfering the contents. Malcolm also came to know a woman called Crystal. 
Crystal lived with her young daughter in a house in Malcolm's town. She also had a drug habit, and she financed it by bringing men back to her house at night while her daughter was asleep. When Malcolm came to visit her, he discovered that her house contained no furniture whatsoever, upstairs or down, only the mattress on which she entertained her male customers. Everything else, he realized, was sold to pay her pimp. Malcolm saw that she might benefit from a particularly large delivery of furniture from the Furniture Resource Center. The day came when Paul and Malcolm filled the delivery lorry with tables, chairs, cupboards, chests of drawers and wardrobes, and in the gaps between them put toys, games and books for the little girl. They arrived at Crystal's house and knocked on the door. No answer. No Crystal and no little girl. What had happened? Had she moved? Been arrested? Died? Was she ill, working, or insulted by the gesture? They had no idea. They couldn't face taking all the furniture back to the center. Then Paul had an idea. Tell you what, he said. How about if we just take all the stuff in anyway? She'll get a surprise when she walks in. Malcolm took a while to realize what Paul was suggesting. You mean break into the house. But as soon as he said it, he recalled that a mere lock was no obstacle to Paul. In no time they were in the house, and the furniture was all off the lorry, the toys all over the floor. Then Crystal arrived home. She saw the open door and ran into the house, shocked and terrified. She saw Malcolm and burst into tears. I can explain, he said, but quickly he perceived that the tears of horror had turned to tears of joy. Her little girl had toys, too many to know what to do with them all. She herself had comfortable chairs and a place to eat and talk and relax. Malcolm was thrilled when he saw her joy. And then he saw Paul. Paul was tearful too, but for a different reason. He'd never made someone happy before. He knew how to break into houses. He'd been told many times how many hearts he'd broken by doing so. Now he'd broken into someone's house, into someone's life, and for the first time brought comedy, not tragedy. Hope, not despair. His new life had begun. The stone that the builders rejected had become the cornerstone. Paul and Crystal were both people who'd been written out of the conventional script of life. The key moment in the story comes when Paul realizes there's a good use for the housebreaking skills he has honed through his adolescence. When these skills are reincorporated into the story, it's the cue for the reincorporation of Paul himself, then Crystal and her daughter, and finally the formation of a new community. Malcolm, and a force greater than Malcolm, found a way of reincorporating rejected stones, first furniture, finally people, and in the process stumbled upon the kingdom. And here, finally, we've come to the theological heart of the church. On the night before he died, Peter rejected Jesus. He denied him three times. Jesus was the stone Peter rejected, but Peter became the stone, the rock, on which the church was founded. And Jesus, the rejected one, became the keystone. Jesus is the stone that the builders rejected, and Peter was one of those builders. But Jesus renamed Peter the stone, and in doing so, made him the cornerstone. The church is founded on and comprised of stones that the builders rejected. See Jesus in the face of the one you have rejected, and let the Jesus you discover in them become your cornerstone.